There's been a number of um, folks on the online and said are interested to hear about what you do out in the landscape. You know, what do you bring? What kinds of paints? Big brushes or little brushes? How much paraphernalia do you bring? Is it cumbersome or you lean out there? And, you know, is there a difference as you've matured as a painter between Irish sky and vacation sky? Because to me, Irish sky really seems like it's about wet paint on wet paint, the sense of the schemes of rain coming in off, off the ocean. Whereas in the vacation sky, the, the main picture, the paint's much, much thicker and it feels more tactile. Well, I, I mean, that's just a, the, the several years of experience and learning to respond to the material um, in different ways. Um, I have a lot of material, a lot of gear, and it's essentially, I t essentially I take my studio outside. I mean, pots of paint, big, big brushes. I, I, I tend to spend my money on really beautiful pigments and I don't spend any money on brushes. I, I buy 69 cent house paint brushes. <laughs> but but, I, but I, 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 I treat them really carefully and after, and they last for a long time. I mean, you get the cost per use of that brush is really, really significant. <laughs> yeah. but, but, but the material sort of gets shaped by the hand and the, and the use of it. So it, you know, each brush has a sort of characteristic mark. But I, I found that um, after a while, uh, I, was, I was looking for some seamless activity between the inside and the outside. So I would take the, I would take the studio setup, and, and mind you, I've never really had a studio set, and for those of you who are painters, you know, glass tables and pallets and big, e e uh, big uh, cranky easels and things. My studio setup is, has been a mirror of what uh, my outdoor setup looks like. It's a little, there's a, big easels of various sizes depending on the, on the canvas, but my, my paints and pallets are set up in a ring around me, and I sit down, uh, sit down when I paint, and I pack my things up and take them outside, and then I pack them up from the outside and bring them, and bring them in, hoping that I'm, I'm transferring the experience of nature that we've had inside, and also bringing the, um, sort of the physicality of the studio, the materiality of the studio outside. So okay. it's very direct. It's, it's, it's very direct, and, 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 as, and as a consequence, I found myself at a tremendous disadvantage when I, when I really made the decision to stop painting outside. I realized I didn't know how to work in a studio. So we'll, that, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. <laughs> so, so, so it, it's, it's really a way of bringing the, uh, the outdoors inside. Uh, one of the interesting things we talked about, and this is a view that was done uh, in Norway in 2004, was you know, thinking about, for instance, Monet, who would go back to the same location day after day to paint a specific time of day. When I asked um, Eric about this picture, um, which is um, about 30 by 36 inches, uh, whether he painted it outside and what that experience was like, it was a very interesting answer. Well, it, I mean, painting outside in the landscape is, uh, is a lot more than just setting up and responding to colors and this time. You have weather, you have various conditions. You also have um, local personalities that, uh, that present themselves. And uh, this, is, um, this is a view from Yerman uh, he's, uh He's a farmer that I, that I met uh, in, in this remote part of uh, the Norwegian mountains. And he was a little apprehensive at first of my, uh, you know, want to know what I was doing. And as, but as soon as he learned uh, my, my fuller intentions, he greeted me every morning with, with a Coca-Cola in hand. And, uh, and, and then by the afternoon, he wasn't drinking Coca-Cola, it turned out. Um, he, he, had, he had other things going on, but he came out with his fiddle, and he played Norwegian. Uh, uh, folk tunes for me while I painted. And so he's standing right over my shoulder. I, I don't have a shadow in here, but what we're looking at is a view across um, the, the, uh, the Hosomo Valley, and this is named after his family, and this is the River Otra here. And that green slash in the distance is the, is the winter farm, and this green field here in the corner is the summer farm. So, you know, he, I'm learning all sorts of things about the culture, the history, the tradition of, of, of this particular landscape, this particular man, his family, and, and his culture. Um, you know, that each, each year for hundreds and hundreds of years, they've driven the sheep and the cattle from that field, which is about 35 miles away, um, maybe a little less, and up to this, up to this field. And I, 
And so I thought about that constantly while I'm, ref you know, I'm sitting on perched on this hill reflecting on this sort of passage from one point in the main to another. And he, there he is reminding me of it. You know, one of the things that I've um, enjoyed most about working with Eric in this exhibition, seeing all the work that's produced over the last 15 years, I've so enjoyed talking about your interests, mm -hmm. the painters that you look at, the painters that you looked at early on as a maturing artist, the painters that you look at now. But in particular, John Constable, we had some great discussions about John Constable, who's, you know, if you put yourself in the context of contemporary painting, John Constable's not a fashionable guy. And yet, Eric, you, you find a, a great deal of um, uh, interest and, if not inspiration, in someone like Constable. In fact, um, we, uh, during our first studio visit, it just so happened that as we were gazing around the studio walls, and the walls are filled with postcards and letters and paintings and drawings, but this painting popped popped out, and uh, so I wonder if you could I talk about it. put it away before you Yeah, so we found it, Eric, and uh, so I wonder if you could just share your, sort of your interest in pain, uh, the painters like Council that inspire you, and, yeah. and, and how they motivate you in the work that you do, or used to do outside, but now do inside. I mean, how, how does a painter take inspiration? I mean, I can, I can look at almost anything, and, feel um, some, some motivation, some impulse to, to, to sit down and make, a, and make a painting. And, you know, working on something like this, which, you know, if I had really thought about it, I wouldn't have shown you. It feels, it feels it's just, I've been calling it a studio fall. It's, it's really sort of about me putting myself in, you know, in Constable's shoes. Mind you, I'm, I'm referring to Constable's Hayway now. Publication from the National Gallery. Yeah, let me just back up a second. Um, th this is John Constable's painting, Dead and Walking Mill from 1820, that's in the Courier's collection and is on view in the European Gallery. This is uh, the painting in question that Eric did, uh, which is named after Constable's Hayway. And then, Eric, I just happen to have an image of that here uh, <laughs> on the lower left. Uh, so if you want to talk about those together, that's that's what the Hayway looks like uh, by Constable on the lower right. Well, I, um, I remember seeing this painting many times. I was a, I was a student in, in in London, and at the time, my classmates were all um, just they were so excited about the the gifts to the to the Tate and the National Gallery of a, a collection of constables and the great trove of, of Turner paintings. And I, I sort of I followed their enthusiasm, but much of their enthusiasm, I mean, like looking, you know, is culturally motivated. I mean, these students were very excited about this work, which were national treasures. And but it meant very little to me. At the same time, I followed, like I said, I followed their enthusiasms and I kept I tried to keep an open mind. But I looked at them again and again and again. I just didn't get it. I didn't understand what the excitement was about. They felt kind of hokey to me. I, I mean I could understand their appeal in a sense sort of sentimental way and nostalgic way, but I wasn't really interested in that. I wanted to I, I couldn't understand those paintings. But mind you, I wasn't painting. And at a certain point in my own work, I started to see the, the commonalities and things that I recognized in those paintings that I had seen 15 or or so years. I mean, I looked at them very closely, wondering what the heck is going on with these paintings. Um, and then it took me so long to understand how how spring loaded they are. You know, Constable, uh, much like I ended up doing uh, by taking you know, my, my job and subsequently my my life to, to Vermont was returning to someplace very familiar. And Constable we left London and went back to his home town, uh, essentially in home region in Suffolk, England, and he painted the, the farm and the mills that his that he worked on as a boy and that his father ran. He knew the he knew that landscape so well and he painted it very casually. And that's ultimately what started impressing me about these and what led me to um, to recognize those those attitudes in my own case. How can you paint something knowingly? How can you paint something you know, with great detail, but not but eschew the detail, not using it? I think with the finished constable paintings, it's amazing um, you know, how representational they are, but at the same time, how fresh and loose they are, the handling of the paint, the, the use of the palette, and as you say, this way of capturing a landscape you know so well in a very different and a very expressive way.